Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always very dangerous uh, advertising a talk for people who are sleep deprived because the odds of them turning up are somewhat lower uh, than those more energised members of the public. But thank you very, very much for making the effort to turn up. Um, as Richard says, uh, my job title is um, a sleep evangelist. Uh, I'm very fond of that title because if I do come and do a talk, it really takes the pressure off. Because if while I'm talking, you do sort of feel your eyelids getting heavy. <laughs> now is the time. I will take it as a compliment. But uh, we are recording today, so if you could keep the snoring to a minimum, that would be excellent. Um, so I thought just to start off, uh, before you have a quick nap, I'm actually going to get you to stand up. Um, this is very deliberate. It means extricating yourself from your laptop or phone for a very short period of time. It's going to be OK. Um, and what I'd like you to do is when you see a statement on the screen which is true for you most of the time, I'd like you to sit down, OK? Uh, so firstly, I rely on an alarm clock to wake up, sort of mostly. <laughs> I fall asleep within five minutes of getting into bed. I use caffeine to keep me going through the day. I can doze in long meetings or talks. I sleep for longer at the weekends to catch up. And there are a few people standing, which is excellent. The vast majority of you have come to the right place. For you guys, hopefully you will still learn even more. Um, please have a seat. Um, it may not surprise you to know that these are all indicators of potential sleep deprivation, which from the looks of things affects most of the people in this room. Um, so, Experts have kind of got together to come up with a consensus of how much sleep we actually need. Now, sleep is a biological characteristic. There is a lot of natural variation. But when they collated loads of studies together, what they came up with is that seven hours is the recommended minimum for optimal health and functioning. Now, most of us actually lie in a broader range between seven and nine hours, but you can anchor the scientific recommendation on a minimum of seven hours for most people. But most studies that look around the world at how much sleep people are getting, this one's from the Rand Corporation, uh, show that at least 40% of the population in developed countries is short of sleep. So Japan here hitting the sleepless ranks uh, very highly, um, followed by the US and even in the UK, at least one in three of us are short of sleep. But what I tend to find when I come and speak to people uh, about sleep in a corporate setting is that probably the proportion is considerably higher. And this is pretty extraordinary because you're all really quite clever, savvy people. Um, yeah, all of you. And you've probably heard an awful lot about why sleep is important. Not just from me, but from some other more established sleep evangelists. So we've got some phenomenal sort of books and speakers, people who are going out and telling you just how important sleep is. So if I could get you to raise your hand if you have either read one of these books or perhaps watched a talk, perhaps a talks at Google on the topic of sleep and how important sleep is in the last sort of three or four years. Okay, so once again, quite a lot of people in the room, which means that if I was to spend the next 30 minutes uh, telling you about all the things that could happen to you if you don't get enough sleep, <laughs> some of these are going to be quite familiar. Now, you could probably take any single one of these and go, do you know what? This is really important to me. If one of these is important to you, might want to make you get more sleep, but all of them together, collectively, surely the case for good sleep is overwhelming. And yet, time and time again, we turn up tired, we turn up with enough sleep. And really what I want to spend the next half hour talking about is why. Not why we sleep, but why we're not getting enough sleep. And hopefully, by understanding the behavioural science and the neuroscience, which is actually preventing a lot of us from getting enough sleep, we can then kind of uh, give some recommendations which will help you to get, get better quality out of the time that you are sleeping. So, 
In order to do this, we need to go back in time. Uh, for many of you, not so long. For me, about 21 years, give or take, to when you were a baby. When you were a newborn. Thank you, Richard, for laughing. Um, <laughs> So, you know, we are born, we don't, nobody teaches us to sleep. We have an innate ability to sleep. It's, it's not a learned behavior, it's something that is very natural, it's driven within us. Um, and when you're a newborn, it's really pretty simple. The longer you've been awake, or the more activity that you've done, the greater the pressure to sleep. So remember that, sleep pressure builds up the longer that you're awake. And we still have this influence influencing our sleep as adults. But as we get older, it gets considerably more complicated. So around about three months old, our body clocks start to kick in. And I'll cover a bit more about those a little bit later. But the other thing that happens as we get older is that we be able to, we're able to consciously override sleep. Those parents in the room will know that this happens with, uh, unfortunately, um, a lot of frequency. Um, but we're able to kind of kick in this conscious override switch, which enables us to prevent sleep from occurring. Now, I'm very, very interested in why this could possibly be the case. Let's face it, from an evolutionary perspective, if sleep provides all of those values, all of those kind of brilliant uh, protective influences on our health and well-being, then why can we prevent sleep from occurring? And for that, you kind of need to go back even further. So our conscious brains evolved probably around about 200,000 years ago, give or take. And while our ancestors were out on the savannah, uh, hunting and gathering, that manual override switch was really helpful. So, I mean, if you went back to our hunter-gatherer days, what type of things would have uh, kept you awake at night, would have made you kind of be able uh, to stay awake at night? What are you trying to prevent from occurring if you're staying awake in that sort of setting? Getting eaten, absolutely. Uh, predators, anything else? Weather could be awful storms. We're not protected uh, by a lovely building like this uh, back in those days. I mean, basically, it was all about threats to survival. We needed to be able to stay awake because we were defending ourselves. It was um, absolutely protective from an evolutionary perspective. So our brains evolved to learn that not sleeping means that we are under threat. That's really important. So inside the brain, threats switch on this highly honed uh, response to boost our survival called the stress response. You probably come across this either called the stress response or the fight or flight reflex. Um, and what happens is when we sense something that we're afraid of, this uh, little red bit, almond shaped bit in the middle, the amygdala, um, switches on this cascade of reactions. So pushes uh, adrenaline into the bloodstream. Uh, we get the heart pumping faster, blood pressure raises, our muscles tense up. Uh, over time, we also produce the stress hormone cortisol. All of these things are getting us raring to go, ready to either fight or flight. Very useful uh, defensive response. The problem is, these days, sleep deprivation may not be due to a threat to our survival. <laughs> We've all been there. Just one more episode. Just one more drink. Just 10 minutes more on that presentation. It's not gonna hurt. It's only 15, 20 minutes. We deliberately keep ourselves awake past the time that our bodies are telling us that we're sleepy, not realizing that we are guilty of sleep sabotage. So evolution is simply not ready for Netflix. By deliberately keeping us awake and making ourselves overtired, we kickstart this stress response. We become hyper vigilant, hyper aroused, and it's much harder to get off to sleep. And even if we do sleep, we actually enter a lighter sleep because there's part of our brain going, oh, I don't want to be eaten by a saber toothed tiger. So we miss out on some of that deep restorative sleep.
To make things even worse, in this survival mode, while our brain is busy prioritizing what's going on in the amygdala, it's switching off, turning down the amount of energy it sends towards another part of our brain, our prefrontal cortex, the bit that controls our self-regulatory capacity, our log logical thought, our goal-directed behavior. The more short of sleep you are, the less likely you are to be able to stick to the goal that you meant to make to fall asleep. It's literally a vicious cycle. So, what can we do to tackle sleep self-sabotage? The overtired brain. Well, it sounds uh, very, very obvious. If you are getting at least seven hours sleep a night, hopefully you're going to enter that state less often. But I think what's key here is whether or not you're getting seven hours or a little bit less, make it a routine. Reduce the cognitive load, that decision-making that says, shall I go to bed now or not? If you know that at 11 p.m. without fail, you are going to sleep, well, it kind of doesn't give you as many options. So it's about sticking to a plan, making a plan and sticking to a plan. And then in the time before bed, obviously there are going to be times that you have to stay up late. You've got stuff to finish. There's a really, really good series on. Whenever you are ready to switch off, don't just get into bed and switch out the light. Your brain is still active. You owe yourself a period of time to wind down. Now, in an ideal world, this is quite a kind of routine that you go through. Uh, maybe it takes an hour on a typical night. So you might declutter your room, you might put your clothes out for the next day, you might lock the doors in the house to make yourself sort of self feel secure. You might have a hot shower, read a book, whatever you do. If you do it in the same order each night, when you tune into that routine, there's a pattern recognition. The body recognizes that you are safe and secure and you're gonna unwind for bed. If you repeat that on enough days of the week, when it comes to being sleep deprived, you can tap into a small part of that routine and the brain kicks in. It goes, I know I'm safe. I know I'm secure. I can relax, wind down and be ready for bed. Finally, develop the skill of relaxation. So um, I was at yoga this morning, developing my skill of relaxation. And uh, the yoga teacher said, You've got to put some effort in when we were just sort of lying down on the ground breathing. And I was like, really? I mean, sorry, relaxation is just relaxation. Relaxation is actually an effortful procedure. It's not just about lying down worrying about the presentation that you've got to give in a few hours time. It's actually about focusing your attention, focusing your attention on the breath making sure that you are slowing the breath down. The technique that you do, use doesn't really matter whether it's mindfulness, meditation, yoga, um, any form of relaxing activity, progressive muscle re relaxation. All of these things will help the mind to detach and the body to relax. You're trying to reset that stress response. I front-loaded quite a lot of science there in case some of you fell asleep a little bit later on. Um, so we will, we'll move on um, to the second reason that I believe that a lot of us don't get enough sleep. And I like to call this blissful ignorance. So a lot of you walked into the room knowing that you want more sleep, knowing that you're not getting enough. But I suspect that you are underestimating just how harmful the impact is on your daily life. Why do I say this? Well, there have been a few studies looking at the impact of a certain amount of sleep on both objective performance and subjective performance, which I'll explain. So this particular study, they got some volunteers and they split them into four groups. The first group got no time in bed at all, and they had to try and maintain that for three days. Uh, the other groups, four hours in bed, six hours in bed, eight hours in bed. So you know how much sleep you regularly get. You can kind of put yourself into one of these groups, whichever is, is, is closest. And during the course of the 14-day experiment, they got people to test their level of alertness. And the way that they did this is using something called the psychomotor vigilance task. All that happens, you sit looking at a screen and some numbers flash onto it. It's incredibly simple. All you have to do is press a button when you see the number occurring. 
So you can make an error by not pressing the button or by pressing the button when there is no number. So it's very much a very simple test of alertness and concentration. So this is what happened to the number of errors that people made over the 14 day experiment. So first of all, we see the group that got no time in bed at all, very rapidly increasing the number of mistakes that they made. Uh, the eight hours in bed group, not too much significant change over time, but what you can see very clearly is that there is this kind of dose response relationship. The less sleep that you're getting, the more likely you are to make mistakes. But what's really significant is that this builds up every night that you are short of sleep the effects of sleeplessness accumulate. And this is what we call a sleep debt. This is something you can build up over time. This kind of makes sense. But what's really worrying is what happened when we ask people how sleepy they are. So this is subjective perception of your sleepiness. So again, if you've got no sleep, you know you're sleepy. But the four hours and six hours people, they didn't report feeling any different to each other. And what's worse is after 10 days, they didn't really think that their level of uh, impairment was any worse than it was after three or four. They are telling themselves, like many of us do, that they've adapted, that they're okay, that they're coping. But the objective data tells a very different story. So we may well be underestimating the impacts of sleeplessness. Just to make it just a teeny bit harder, um, as many of you will know if you heard Matthew Walker's talk, sleep is absolutely essential for learning and memory. As you learn new stuff during the day, hopefully as you're sitting here picking up a few nuggets of information, your brain is actually expanding with the knowledge. It's like a sponge, it can only suck up a certain amount. And sleep is the process which returns the kind of really interesting, emotionally resonant memories into your long-term memory. And it also recharges that short-term memory, allowing you to learn new things. So if you're not sleeping terribly well and it's having an impact on your performance, you might not remember it tomorrow. You'll probably tell yourself that you're going to adapt all over again. And people can just get in this cycle where they're not actually, they can't really remember what it was like to sleep well. They just tell themselves that they're coping. You've got to kind of break this cycle and remember what it's like to have a good night's sleep. So how do we do that? Well, first things first, um, you've got to repay that sleep debt. The good news is you do not need to repay it hour for hour. The body is very adaptable, it's very clever. If you've had a really poor night's sleep, the next night it will slip into a deeper sleep. You'll have more of the, the REM sleep, which helps to recharge your emotions and memories. So there is an adaptability there. It's just that if you're constantly short of sleep, you're not allowing the brain to recharge. So repay the sleep debt, take a vacation. Um, make sure that you've got several days when you can actually sleep for as long as you like. And then you've got to work out what's your natural sleep window. So if you were to go to bed each night when your eyelids start to get tired and wake up without an alarm, how much sleep is that? And some of you go, well, I, I do that at the weekend and it's 10 or 11 hours. I can't have 10 or 11 hours. And that's because you're repaying some of your missing sleep debt from the week. You've got to give yourself a chance. Definitely, I would recommend a vacation. Always recommend it. Um, once you have your sleep window, first thing to do is set a, a routine wake time. Set your um, time that you can get up sort of 90% of the time within an hour or so. And once you've started adapting to that, and we'll talk in the, the next bit about the body clock and how helpful that can be, but can you find a time where your body wakes up naturally so you're not constantly reliant on an alarm? That's a good indicator to you that you are getting enough sleep. And if you can't get that seven hours all in one block at night, do not be afraid to nap. I know that um, Google's renowned for having invested in, in napping pods. You've got some really great environments in the workspace where you can actually go and take a power nap. 
Now, a power nap is so called, as many of you will know, um, because roughly around about 20 to 25 minutes will get you into a deep enough sleep to restore your cognitive functions, give you a, your mood a, a boost um, in terms of sort of happiness and well-being, but it's not long enough to drift into deep sleep. Typically, after about 45 minutes or so, you get into deep sleep. And if you wake up from deep sleep, you are properly out of it. You're, you've got this thing called sleep inertia, and it can take you a full hour to wake up again. So if you're gonna nap, my advice would be, um, as we'll see in a moment, do it in the circadian low after lunch and keep it to 15 to 20 minutes. Okay? So that's blissful ignorance uh, about lack of sleep. Why else are we not sleeping enough? You heard it here first. You've heard of the obesogenic environment. Now I would like to propose to you the sleeplessogenic environment which maybe doesn't rattle off the tongue quite so well, but I'm, I'm sure you can imagine uh, what I'm talking about. So back on the savannah, as hunter-gatherers, uh, before we had watches and phones, um, we used to rely on the sun to tell us what time of day it was. And we evolved our level of activity to be guided very much by the sun. So our alertness follows this sort of pattern. As we wake up in the morning, our alertness sort of boosts um, right up until about midday. After lunch, we have this circadian low, sometime between about 1 and 3 p.m., where our energy levels dip. That's just innate within us. Then we pick up as it's time to go home from work, and as it starts to get dark, our energy levels start to dip, and that's when, naturally, we feel more sleepy. But the remarkable thing about this pattern is that even if you take light, sunlight, away, this pattern persists. So if you were to take any cell from your body and put it in a petri dish and put it in a cupboard with all the things that it needed, it would actually operate on a 24-hour rhythm. The same thing would happen to you if you went and lived in a cave underground for two months. You might not think this is a good idea, but a French guy actually went and did it. And he was able to show that his circadian rhythm persisted even in the absence of light. Now, in fact, his circadian rhythm ended up being about 24 and a half hours. So after a couple of months, he was out of sync with the external environment. But it was through exposure to light that he was able to then, as he returned to the outside world, bring his body clock back on track. So we have literally trillions of these body clocks all around our body, trying to operate on a 24-hour rhythm. Some of them are more active during the night. So growth hormone, for example, gets produced during the night. It's a really strong uh, time for growth and repair. Um, whereas Obviously, our kind of conscious functions are switched off at night. We produce less urine. Our body uh, pressure, blood pressure goes down, for example. So in order for the, for the body to work most efficiently, we want all of our body clocks to work in tune. And you will know, if you've ever had jet lag, what happens when your body clocks start to be out of sync with each other and with the external environment. So light is an incredibly powerful driver for coordinating our body clocks all together, making us work efficiently. Um, and darkness, conversely, is what enables the body to produce melatonin, the hormone that signals to the body that it's time to sleep. So we have this alerting function, which sort of gets stronger and stronger as the light gets brighter and drops away at night. Um, and then I mentioned earlier, as babies, we have this sleep pressure that builds up the longer that we've been awake. So actually, as adults, both of these two drivers work to control our level of alertness at one time or another. Now, interestingly, for this sleep pressure, there is a way to block that. Any, any ideas what will block your sleep pressure? Caffeine. Caffeine. Absolutely. So what's actually happening there is, as sleep pressure builds up is that you have this uh, waste product from activity called adenosine that just builds up in the brain and makes you feel drowsy. And caffeine basically muscles in and masks 
the adenosine receptors. So you don't actually feel that same level of drowsiness. At the same time, it's upping your stress hormones, making you feel nice and jittery and alert. But when the caffeine degrades, the adenosine is still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. And so you can get this wave of tiredness, this caffeine crash from all the adenosine that's been building up, but you've been masking its effects so you didn't realize how tired you really were. So the environment that most of us now work in, this is not the savannah. This might well be YouTube or Google or any, pretty much any office around the world. Um, what can you see here that might interfere with either your body clock or your sleep drive? Lights, lots of light, lots of technology. So um, it turns out that the brilliant uh, designers of laptops, phones, they typically like to use the same wavelength of light, blue light, uh, which mirrors the midday sun the strongest alerting signal that you can get. Um, and you've also got sort of caffeine. You've also got people grazing through the day. One of the things the body clock likes is routine. It likes to know the times where you can actually sit and rest and digest a meal. It's going to depower your stress response system because you're forcing it to kind of properly stop, rest and digest. If you graze, you don't have those same intervals through the day. The sleep hygienic environment. Uh, so, what can you do if you are out of sync with your body clock? I know I've already mentioned having a routine, but this really is incredibly important to help your body. If your routine is haphazard, so sometimes you go to bed at 11, sometimes 1, your body doesn't know when to produce melatonin. So it just doesn't, it just kind of holds back. Whereas if you have a regular routine, your body can anticipate what's going to happen. It can help you, it will make you feel tired at the same times each day. Uh, we've mentioned lights. Um, one of the best things is just to go outside. I'm sorry that I'm keeping you inside this lunchtime. Hopefully we'll finish a little bit early and you can go out and soup up a lot of like, nice, uh, natural sunlight to keep you going. Um, caffeine, obviously, I've said, masks your sleep drive. So I'm not saying don't use it. It can also be really good for alertness, but use it strategically. Be aware that the half-life of caffeine is six hours. So six hours later, you've still got half of the kind of virulence, half of the power of that cup of coffee in your bloodstream. The recommendation in this country is it shouldn't have more than 400 milligrams of caffeine in a day. That's about two or three cups of filter coffee or two Starbucks, I think. So just be really aware of how much you're having. And if you need pepping up, try sunlight or try other natural energizers. So exercise actually tends to kickstart the body clock. Social interaction stop and have a chat, it's really, it really gets your body clock going, makes you feel naturally alert. Okay, finally, the final reason that I think a lot of us really can't sleep, and <laughs> that's insomnia. So for most of those other reasons, there's at least a voluntary element. We are making choices which are depriving us of sleep. But for some of you in the room, I am sure you're sitting there going, I've tried all this and I still can't sleep. Insomnia is a condition where you can't get off to sleep, you can't stay asleep or you wake up feeling unrefreshed for at least three nights a week or more for three months or more. It's a very much a chronic condition. And what tends to happen is that just like many of us, there's some sort of stress that temporarily stops you sleeping. But this lack of sleep actually becomes a source of stress and anxiety. Often people with insomnia, even going into their own bedroom, they start to feel anxious. So what do you do if you're trying to cope with a lot of stress and anxiety? There's usually some sort of behavioral compensation. For some of us, it's alcohol. We need to relax. And actually, alcohol, yep, it does make us relax in the short term. Unfortunately, it totally messes with your natural sleep architecture. 
you don't get the same level of restorative sleep, so you wake up feeling unrefreshed. Also messes with your memory. So it's, it's, it makes people think that they're coping, but actually makes the sleep worse. And so then they start to believe that they'll never sleep again. These very unhelpful thoughts on cognitions, defeatism around sleep, very often insomnia increases the risk of anxiety, depression, as well as another, uh, a number of other stress-related illnesses. So you get into this state of chronic, physical and mental hyperarousal. If you put someone with insomnia into a brain scanner, what you'll see is that their brain is more active, not just during the day, but also at night. So, you've got to be able to redress the balance. I mentioned earlier this uh, fight or flight stress response. So we have two arms of this thing called the autonomic nervous system, which controls all of our unconscious functions like breathing and our heart rate and our digestion. And in insomnia, you've kind of got, you're overloading this fight or flight stress response. And what you want to do is wake up this parasympathetic converse action of the body for rest and digest. So what can you do? Basically, you've got to tackle both the thoughts associated with uh, insomnia, the unhelpful sleep thoughts, and also the behaviours that are making it persist. So there's a couple of um, quick techniques I can give you. Uh, a cognitive technique, putting the day to rest. This is very, very simple. It's free and it involves a piece of paper and a pen. So when you are doing that wind down routine before bed, protect five or 10 minutes, sit down with your piece of paper and your pencil and write down what's worrying you, just what's on your mind, what you're thinking about that you need to do tomorrow. Make sure that you commit it to paper and put it next to your bed. So that if you are lying there trying to get to sleep, but these thoughts keep popping into your mind, you can just tell yourself it's on the page. It will still be there tomorrow. You do not need to think about it now. It almost sounds too simple to be effective, but one trial found that even this simple intervention alone could increase significantly uh, people's ability to fall asleep. But there are behavioral techniques as well. So all of the things that I've already mentioned, plus some extras. So, um, there's one called the quarter hour rule. If you are in bed, unable to sleep for more than 15 minutes, get up, get out of your room, go somewhere else until you feel your eyelids heavy and starting to close. What you want to do is break any sort of negative connection between yourself and your bedroom and being unable to sleep. Your bedroom should be this haven for sleep and intimacy, that's allowed. And everything that I've been talking about today, all the tips, all the science, is actually part of uh, a toolkit that we call CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy for Insomnia. And it's actually the recommended first-line treatment for insomnia, um, so tackling the negative thoughts and negative behaviours. There is a little bit of a problem with CBT for insomnia in that very few people are actually trained to deliver it at the moment. Um, if you can get it on the NHS, it tends to be a, a very long waiting list. Um, and it was this that actually inspired uh, the company that I work for. Um, so a professor of sleep medicine called Colin Espy had been a clinical psychologist for 30 years, seeing patients, helping them with CBT for insomnia, and knowing that he couldn't possibly help all the people that needed help. Um, so he actually worked with a former insomnia patient called Peter Hames to create an online digital version of CBT for insomnia. So essentially it automates all of the functions that a therapist uh, would go through with you and teaches you the tools and techniques to sleep better. Um, so if you find your way to Sleepio, you'll be able to do a very quick online sleep test. This takes less than two minutes to fill in. And it gives you a sleep score between naught and 10. If you have 10 out of 10, congratulations. If you do not, hopefully there's more we can do to help you. Um, so you can sign up for a, a few sort of evidence-based sleep guides that you get by email. But the main thrust of the program is actually a weekly session with the prof, your animated sleep expert. 
Hello there, Sophie. I am the prof, and I'm here to do everything I can to help you sleep better. Now, you may be thinking, why should I trust you to tell me what to do? Well, everything we do here at Sleepio is rooted firmly in scientific evidence. So you meet the prof each week and he teaches you tools and techniques and you use a sleep diary to track your progress. And the nice thing about being mobile is that obviously at any time of day or night you can be helped to know what you should be doing to optimise your sleep. And the prof mentioned evidence and I just wanted to, to make you aware of, of one study that you may or may not be aware of. This is a few years ago, um, back in 2014, uh, we started speaking to Google about Sleepio and they said, well, you have got a randomised placebo controlled trial and that's interesting, but will it work for Google? Because we're different. Uh, so we did, <laughs> we did another trial uh, with 270 Googlers. Uh, we randomised them into two groups, either using Sleepio or just carrying on, on with whatever they were doing at the time, followed them up after eight weeks, and then uh, the group who'd used Sleepio were able to continue to use it if they wanted to, and the second group got access. And we measured things like sleep quality and well-being. And I'm just going to show you one uh, piece of data, which is on well-being. Um, so here you can see group one, significant uplift in well-being. And this was things like, I'm satisfied with my overall well-being. I'm able to detach from work during non-work hours. I'm able to cope effectively with work-related stress. And I feel that my workload is manageable. The improvements were maintained three months later, and the second group saw very similar improvements to the first. And this just mirrors what we've now seen in eight randomized controlled trials in over 6,000 people. CBT for insomnia works. And if you want to read more, there's a fascinating paper that you can find. Um, since then, actually, an awful lot of Googlers have been using the program. Over 5,500 have met the prof, and uh, on average, they're getting two and a half extra hours sleep each week, and they're reporting less stress and less anxiety. So you could try it. I don't know, it might be, might be helpful. Um, so just to sum up, uh, I haven't written a book. Um, I tried to come up with some memorable acronym, and I'm not sure that I've succeeded, but I was thinking harness the power of sleep. Uh, so P is for planning ahead, prioritizing that seven hours. O is for getting outdoors as much as possible. W is protecting that wind down routine. Whether you have 30 minutes or 60 minutes, make that time work for you in unwinding for sleep. E is for energizing. You still want to energize your body during the day, but do it as naturally as you can. And think about limiting your caffeine, switching out caffeine for decaf where it makes sense. And finally, R, um, I've said this a lot of times today, routine, routine, routine. That's really going to help your body clock. And set reminders on your phone, uh, remind other people in your family that actually you're going to try this and commit to it because it will be better for all of you. That's it. Thanks. Oh. Hi, th thanks for the speech. Uh, at first. Thank you. And um, I have a question regarding sleeping with light, natural light, versus sleeping in the darkness. Because I personally have a problem like with light. So I wake up at six if the light, natural light is there at six, or the same with every time. So what is the suggestion? Is there kind of a rule or something? Um, so are you thinking when it gets light in the mornings, it's disturbing your sleep? You don't want to get up at six? Yeah, yeah, a lot. Like, for example, if my routine is seven to eight hours and it starts at midnight or at 11, it doesn't work if the sun rises at five. Absolutely. And um, if you didn't have to go to work and you were able to live on the savannah quite happily, you wouldn't mind. And you would rise naturally with dawn um, and that would be fine. Your body clock would adjust through, through the year. But yes, we all have other commitments. So if you actually want to sleep for longer, very easy. Um, make sure that you have blackout blinds, you know, really try and interfere actually with that morning sunshine if that's not what you want. Uh, sometimes people say, yes, but my partner wants the sun. What do I do? Um, there's a very simple intervention called a sleep mask. A soft, <laughs> I know, it's very, very cheap, very, very simple. Um, 
often if you wear one for a night or two, you're like, oh, I don't know about this. But actually most people who stick to it for three or four nights, they're like, oh, actually, this really makes a difference. And one of the advantages of wearing a sleep mask is if you go traveling, it's something you can take with you anywhere. And if you're developing a napping habit, because actually you're n unable to get enough sleep during the night, having a sleep mask sort of with you, it kind of creates this little cocoon effect that can be quite helpful. Um, so yeah, if light is disturbing you, block out the light. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. So can you speak a bit about uh, using some medications, say uh, melatonin? Because I know, for instance, in the US you can buy it like in any pharmacy, but here you, you can't, you need to get prescription. So is there a kind of consensus about it or? Yeah, so that's an interesting one. Melatonin is a natural hormone, as we saw. Um, it definitely signals to the body that it's time for sleep. But what it doesn't do is override your stress response. So it's not a very powerful hormone uh, in terms of tackling insomnia. So the effects of using melatonin on insomnia are, are pretty much null. They're, they're not strong. Um, what melatonin can be very helpful for is if your body clock is out of sync with the environment, because it's really something that influences your body clock more than anything. Um, so if you're jet lagged, actually very, very helpful for adjusting over time. Um, there are some questions about melatonin, just like most other natural hormones. If you're taking it, does it mean that your body is actually going to produce less? And I think that's a potential concern that I'm not sure that the research has been done long term to work out whether actually taking artificial melatonin may in some way disrupt your natural patterns. So I, with most of these things, I wouldn't take something artificial for a long time. It'd be much better to sort your habits out. But if you have a short-term uh, stress, like lots of travel and jet lag, I think very, very helpful. That helps. Hi, um, I'm just wondering, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering what's your view on the, the quantification and measurement of all the sleep stats and all the watches we have, uh, etc. And the second question is, any tips for taking power naps? Because sometimes it's very difficult for me to fall asleep after I'm awake? Yes. Um, okay, so first question uh, about measurement. Um, so the only way to know exactly what's going on during the brain, uh, when in the brain during sleep, um, is to measure the electrical impulses. So an electroencephalogram, which will actually tell you the different stages of sleep. Um, and I didn't show it in the presentation. We tend to have around about sort of three main stages of sleep and then a REM, rapid eye movement sleep. Um, so stage one, very light sleep, you can very easily get woken up. Few people dipping in stage one now. Uh, and then stage two is a kind of true sleep where your body temperature starts to go down, blood pressure starts to go down. But stage three is where it's very, very hard to wake you up and you've got growth hormone being produced. And then you come back through these cycles of REM sleep, the dream sleep, which is so important for memory consolidation and um, emotional balance. So basically, we sleep in these five or six sleep cycles. Most of the trackers that you wear, they used to just rely on movement. And it so happens that during REM sleep, your body is actually paralyzed. So you, we think, you know, so that you can't act out your dreams. So they use an algorithm based on your movement to kind of predict, oh, okay, there was a period of not moving, that must be the end of a sleep cycle. That's not a very good way of estimating whether or not somebody is awake or asleep, because we can all lie very still and not be asleep. Um, the newer, new age kind of trackers, which use um, heart rate variability or pulse rate, those seem to be better, but there's been relatively little published validation to show that they are as good as a polysomnogram, where you go into the lab and have lots of things measured. But I did see a small study recently, um, which was using one of the, the Fitbit kind of new age, which actually showed pretty good sort of specificity and sensitivity to sleep. What you probably don't want to do is compare your sleep to somebody else's sleep using those trackers. I think it's okay to use it as a guide for you, um, but then you've got to ask, why am I using it? The best measure of whether or not you are getting good quality sleep is how you feel during the day. And your tracker can't really help you with that. Um, the second question was about naps. Any tips for naps? Um, so a lot of us will have this very strong body clock. 
Um, and actually, we won't have a very strong lull after lunch. Um, and it's quite hard for us to nap. If you don't feel sleepy, don't nap. That's one thing. Um, it is something to, to adapt as a habit. Your body clock learns. So if you keep trying and protecting your 20 minutes after lunch when you think you are probably um, in need of a reboost, even if you're just sitting quietly, maybe you're meditating, it's probably still going to have a restorative effect because you'll probably still be able to up your parasympathetic nervous system, your rest or digest, and start to feel physically refreshed, even if you haven't done all of the memory kind of recharging in the brain. So I think it's still worth having a break, even if it's not a nap. Okay, I have a quick question. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you for coming to Google. This is really great, I really enjoyed it. So thank you for that. You. Um, quick question about like winding down. So for instance, I have the problem of waking up really early. So I try to go to bed early, but because I'm always on, like very switched on, in the morning I'll wake up like five o'clock, right? And then I can't get back to sleep until let's say 6.30, a reasonable time to get up. So I'm wondering any tactics for continuing to sleep, right? If you've gotten let's say six hours, but you wake up because you're kind of wired, how do you actually get yourself for another hour into sleep mode? I'm sure there's a lot of people probably in the room who are interested in the answer to that one. And what interested me there is that you've said, you know, I wake up so early in the morning, so I try and go to bed earlier at night. And that's kind of your mistake. You're waking up exactly as you say, because you're a bit sort of wired. You are kind of in this vigilant sort of state. Um, so there's a lot in terms of the, the relaxation techniques and learning to detach from all this excitement, exciting stuff going on in your life. But there's also something in increasing your sleep pressure. So one of the things that we do in CBT is to use a technique called sleep restriction, which sounds very counterintuitive but it actually involves pushing your bedtime back. So if you normally go to bed at 10, say, but you're waking up at five o'clock in the morning, despite the fact that you wanted to sleep until till seven, you know, maybe in that time, you're only getting six hours sleep. So by tracking your sleep over a couple of weeks using a sleep diary, the advice would be, okay, try and go to bed at one o'clock in the morning. Set your alarm for seven or whatever your, your desired wake up time is, you are going to get incredibly tired trying to keep yourself awake. But you will build up a stronger sleep pressure and you'll start to sleep through the night. And then as you've started to sleep through the night, you can increase your sleep window. The other way to do it is a slightly kind of softer approach. Rather than going straight in for one o'clock in the morning, you could just compress a little bit and keep compressing if it's not sort of working for you. But those, that sleep restriction idea gets introduced in week three of the Sleepio program. It's probably the single most powerful technique in CBT for helping people reset that sort of wakefulness early in the morning issue. So definitely give that a go. Thank you. I'll sneak in a question from someone who's not in the room. Uh, we have Dory today. Um, so the question is, uh, do alarms based on the sleep cycle, deep versus light, uh, work? So I think that relates to the sort of tracking question. Um, unless your brain is, is cued into a, a lab, it's very difficult to know what stage of sleep you're in. Um, I haven't seen a lot of convincing evidence, but that's probably because a lot hasn't been published. If it works for you, I say use it. And a lot of this kind of sleep science, it's very individual. If there's something that you find reassuring, so for example, chamomile tea, some people swear by. The actual evidence from scientific trials is pretty equivocal, probably doesn't really do very much. But there's a very strong placebo effect. Anything that makes you feel like you are sleeping well, it's probably a good idea for you personally, even if the science is a bit kind of shaky. Um, so. Hi. Uh, what do you recommend for winding down at night? Uh, the other question is, if I want to go to bed at 11, uh, is it a bad idea to go to the gym like between 9 and 10 in the evening? Okay, I'll take, I'll take the gym one um, first. It used to be thought, the advice used to be not to exercise late at night. And the reason being because it increases your body temperature. It really gets, gets the body going. And um, there was some <coughs> evidence that absolutely, if your body is too hot, you cannot sleep. So one of the things I didn't mention is to cool your room. So an ideal um, room temperature is 18 degrees, supposedly, with air circulating if possible. 
So uh, subsequent to that, the advice is actually some people are really quite effective at cooling down, like mentally and physically, after they've been to the gym. So I would have thought that if you're doing something highly aerobic, it's going to take you at least an hour, if not 90 minutes, to properly calm down after that. So you want to allow enough time for that. Um, but this is about being a scientist of yourself and kind of experimenting. Um, you know, if you push that exercise time a little bit forward, does it make your sleep better and so on? Because it will be different for different people. Um, in terms of the wind down routine, um, you can ask parents what they do for their kids and everyone's probably got a slightly different pattern but they get into a pattern and that's what's important, that's what gets reassuring. It doesn't matter if you have a bath or a shower or you read or you meditate. I know that um, Google's got some really good resources, I know you've got Headspace is available um, if you want to learn mindfulness meditation. Um, just reading a book that is not you know, an energising, sort of alerting, light-filled experience Watching TV, so long as you're far enough away that you're not getting overstimulated by the content, I definitely wouldn't do that right before bed, but as part of an hour-long wind-down routine, that might be fine. It is just about psychological and physical kind of detachment from the day. Yes, I want to ask you about um, noise in the morning. We talked about light in the morning. Um, like earplugs, I, you know, maybe it's not good to use them every night. I'm wondering about other ways. Can you train yourself to not be sensitive to noise or noise generators or what do you suggest? Good question. Um, some people definitely find white noise machines very useful. Um, this doesn't have to be something very expensive. It could be a fan. Uh, I think Wayne Rooney swore by, like he said he couldn't sleep without the noise of the washing machine or something like that. There, there are certain noises which will block out other sounds. So a fan in summer can be quite good. Um, an artificial noise machine, absolutely fine. There isn't any evidence that so long as it's not too loud that that's going to disrupt your sleep. I also don't think there are any issues with using earplugs long term. Um, provided that they're, you know, good quality. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about using earplugs as a negative. I think actually it's quite sensible. Time for one more question. Oh, wow, thank you. Uh, <laughs> make, it, make it a good one. Um, so during the week, I um, rarely get enough sleep. And then at the weekend, I do sleep longer. Is that sufficient? I mean, you, you talked about the brain self-repairing. Yeah, so here's the thing. Um, it's better to sleep than not to sleep, so great that you're making an effort to catch up on sleep at the weekend. But for every night of short sleep, you are feeling those effects. On your Tuesday, your Wednesday, your Thursday, and your Friday, you are building up that sleep debt. So by Friday afternoon, I hope you're not operating heavy machinery. But you know, it, it's not ideal. If you can find even just an extra half an hour during the week, what you'll actually find is that you have more weekend. You've got more of a life because you don't have to worry about catching up on your sleep. The other thing is that come Monday morning, you're effectively giving yourself jet lag if you have a different pattern during the week to the weekend. And there is some uh, research evidence that's come out suggesting that uh, this sort of pattern, we do call it social jet lag, um, can increase risks of high blood pressure, of weight gain. It's, it's putting more pressure on your body than is necessary. So if you can find more of a balance, great. <laughs>